Okay, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, good afternoon, everybody, and, and thanks for making it to the presentation. And today I'm going to be talking about um, developing a good practices guide for fishery stock assessment. There we go. Okay, sorry, I had a bit of technical difficulty here, but it seems to be working now. So um, basically what, what stock assessment scientists do is they, they take um, several pieces of information and then try and put those together to provide uh, um, advice on, on managing the stocks. And it's really up to the stock assessment scientists um, to decide how to put those pieces of information together and, and what decisions and assumptions they make. And these can be very uh, subjective. And um, what we probably really want is we want something a little bit more objective, a little bit more automated, and sort of like a, a computer or a robot or something like that to, to try and um, do this for us. Um, and um, when I did my bachelor's degree um, in Auckland University in New Zealand, I did a double major in uh, computer science. And then um, when I was doing my master's degree and doing a, a thesis on stock assessment, I was still interested in computers. So I was taking um, some computer courses. And um, one of the courses I took was a course in expert systems. And that was the, the big rage back in the uh, 1990s. And essentially, from what I could understand, it was basically just a, a decision tree. And you'd go through and you'd answer these questions and you'd come out with um, a sort of a result which told you what to do. Um, and the main part of the developing the expert system was um, determining the decision probabilities. Um, and back in the 1990s, we didn't really have all these uh, machine learning automated techniques and we didn't have the huge databases either that they use today to, to develop. Um, some of these sort of ways that we can um, answer questions. And so most of it was basically just about doing research in that to, to determine these probabilities. And so back there being really naive, I thought maybe after I finished my, uh, my thesis, then I could create an expert system to uh, do stock assessments. But here we are 30 years later and, and we're still working on it. Um, so yeah, so we have this uh, expert system or this computer program that, that's going to do this task for us. Um, but um, behind that is always going to be a human. So someone has to actually program the computer or make the robot. And um, if you look at all the, the movies and things you see um, at, at the picture theatres, there's always some evil supervillain behind the robot that's that's causing problems around the world. And that's not really what we want to do. What we want to do is we want to have like a group of experts, hopefully not as evil, um, to develop the, the expert system so that we can automate the process of, of doing stock assessments. And that's really what is behind the development of, of CAPM. Um, and one of the, the main goals of it is to, to, to basically get people to do research to develop uh, good practices. And um, we've had a long series of, of workshops um, looking at the different topics um, related to stock assessment. And we, like um, was mentioned before, uh, there's a, one on natural mortality this year. But next year, um, the date's still a bit tentative, but in October of November uh, next year, we're going to have a, uh, a workshop that's going to review all the different topics. Um, and this is really sort of a way to um, get the good practices guide sort of uh, started. Um, and so we've already got a, a list of, um, you know, highly experienced experts in um, these different topics lined up. Uh, most of them are people that have already been heavily involved in, in the cap and process and, and they are noted here. Um, so why, why did I call this a no BS um, a guide to fishery stock assessment? And um, the reason for that is that 
we have a lot of choices on how to do the stock assessments. And everyone tends to be doing things differently. Even within the same lab, um, people can do different th things differently. Uh, so what we need is we need to really uh, a guide on, on how to, to, to best do these, or at least to start um, developing a stock assessment and perhaps uh, modifying that as you, as you go through the process. Um, it's, there's also a lot of uh, um, research being done, but it's not doesn't tend to be as coordinated and there's often a, a bit of duplication going and so it's it's quite a good idea to try and coordinate people to to really focus on on solving some of the major issues we have in doing assessments and so to develop a good practice guide we've got we've got to start somewhere um, so what I've done here is I'm, I'm putting together a straw man so that people can um, start discussing uh, the different topics and, and, and really what we should be doing. And so the, the main goal here is to basically for you guys to um, listen to this, see if there's any BS and call it. And so um, at the end of each topic, um, I'm going to stop for a little bit and um, answer a few questions. Um, we don't have much time for questions after each topic, um, so I basically want to focus on the questions about the main concepts, not, not specific details. And so I want you to call the BS, I want you to tell me why it's BS, and I want you to tell me what should be done instead. And hopefully at the end, um, we'll have uh, time for more questions and perhaps go into some of the, the more details. So here's, here's the outline of all the different topics. Um, the only thing I want to point out here is that there's three topics that I'm not going to cover in much detail. That's stock structure, uh, data limited methods, and spatial models. And particularly, I'm not going to cover spatial models because uh, it's, it's a big topic in itself. But at the end, I'm also going to um, discuss a solution to, to some of the major issues in, in stock assessment. Okay. So here, we'll start off with the, the first topic, which is stock structure. And um, this is really hard. And it's partly because we don't have a lot of tagging data or genetic data that we can use to uh, determine the stock state, a uh, stock structure. And so um, the stock structure could also be um, part of the reason for a lot of the data conflicts that we see in stock assessment. For example, there might be multiple interacting uh, subpopulations within the area that you're assessing and there's not full mixing, and that be, could be causing things like local depletion. Or you could be uh, assessing a, a part of the stock which doesn't cover the whole stock, and so there's some um, uh, interactions coming from outside the area where you're assessing it, causing some issues as well. So in the rest of the presentation, I'm going to assume that, um, that we know the stock structure, um, and um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about stock structure as one of the, the first major issues that needs to be um, dealt with as well at the end of the talk. Okay, so the first uh, topic I want to talk about in more detail is uh, CPUE standardization. And a lot of uh, assessment people are fortunate to have uh, survey data but in a lot of other cases, we don't have surveys because it's too expensive or uh, it's not practical. And so we rely on um, catch per unit effort data to create indices of relative abundance. So what we need to do here is we need to have an index of abundant that, abundance that represents the whole population, or at least the component of the population you want to represent like a certain age classes. Um, and we don't want to use any unrepresentative indices of abundance. And what I mean here is if you have a look at the panel here on the top right, we have El Nino, La Nina and neutral years. And you can see here, if you only use this area here as, as your index of abundance, you can see in El Nino years, you get a really low abundance. So you would say that the population was low, but it's only because the population has moved into a different area. So you want to make sure that your index of abundance covers the whole distribution of the stock if you can. And so this means don't um, create indices of abundance based on areas as fisheries, which is often what we commonly do. 
And so we, we probably should be using uh, spatial temporal models to fill in the missing data and then uh, do area weighting. So basically you are summing up each of the individual areas that you've uh, predicted the um, CPUE for. Um, one of the issues that we have in this type of approach is often the sampling is not very representative and that's what you can see here on the lower panels in the right hand side. And so here in the El Nino year, you're actually getting a big missing area here uh, where you have no samples, um, but you need to be able to predict the abundance of the population there. And so when you have things like um, spatial changes in the distribution due to the environment, or if you have uh, tissue expansion and contraction, um, there can be some problems uh, related to filling in and uh, also the preferential sampling problems as well. Okay, so um, you know most most people have considered spatial um, aspects of CPUE standardization, but one thing that we often forget is the composition data that goes along with that index of abundance. And typically, what we do is we we share the the composition between the fishery and the index of abundance because it's coming from the same uh, data set. But what we really should be doing is we should be standardizing the composition data using the spatial temporal models as well, along with the index. And the index um, composition should be representing the abundance of the population and not the catch. Okay, and so what that requires is basically spatially weighting the index composition data by CPUE and then weighting the fishery catch composition data by the catch and then treating those as separate pieces of information in the stock assessment model. So you have a composition data particularly for the index and composition data particularly for the catch. Um, this is not independent, so there's some issues there, but that's probably the least of our worries. It's more important to make sure that we're separating out the composition data from the catch and the index of abundance. If you look at the right, on the right here, we have um, an example, I think it's from Big Eye Tuna, where we have uh, in blue is the, uh, the nominal composition data. So that's basically just summing up the samples. And then in green, we have the CPUE weighted composition and in red is the catch weighted composition. And you can see here that if we use just the, the nominal composition, it's quite different than the other two which would cause us some issues in our, in our stock assessment modeling. Um, but even in the catch and the CPUE, you can see some differences. Uh, this example, it may not be as important, um, but in other examples, it might be. So for, here's the summary of, of what we should be doing for CPUE standardization. So basically using spatial temporal models and making sure that you weight the index a composition by CPUE and the catch composition by catch and putting those separately into the model. So I'm going to open it up for questions on uh, CPUE standardization. Um, so hopefully we've got a couple of questions we could talk about. Let's see, we have a question from Andre. What about precision when standardizing the composition data? So does Andre mean the weighting we should include in the model when we're fitting to the composition that's coming out of uh, the spatial temporal model? Let's see. Can I speak? Yes, go yeah. for it. I'm I'm coming from the non-tuna world here where, you know, the amount of CPUE data is going to be enormous and the amount of comp data could be really, really limited. Um, and I was wondering at what point do you end up with a situation where you're just basically creating comp data unless you do something like vastize your comp data or something. So what do you, what do, you do with small sample sizes for the comps, which is probably more common for species most species than are is the case for tunas yes so um that's what i'm suggesting is you'd use vast on the composition data as well so you'd be filling in the missing cells or the low sample size spatial cells with the uh, vast analysis 
And and when you do that, are you talking now space and season? I mean, there's a lot of dimensions to comp data. Uh, it, it could be season. Uh, in our tuna models, we've done it on a quarterly basis. Um, the the computation, uh, the computational intensity of these analyses can be quite high, particularly if you're using link frequency rather than age. And so you might have to use fairly coarse size bins, like I think we use 10 centimeter bins. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I did call bullshit on stock structure, just to say. I thought maybe yeah. we could save that one for the end. <laughs> yeah, we, we've got a solution to that, Andre, so don't worry. Um, Mark, I also, there are two more questions related to CPUE that are hopefully pushed uh, to be public, um, but if you want to keep moving and save those to the end, just let me know. Yeah, I think I'll move on to the next topic. Okay. Okay, so the next topic is uh, fishery structure. And so the main reason to um, develop uh, fisheries in a stock assessment model is to uh, model selectivity and so that we can fit to the composition data. Uh, we could also be using it for management objectives like separating out fisheries by gear because we're going to do projections or management by gear. But for assessment purposes, it's mainly to uh, model selectivity. And the reason we're modeling selectivity is we want to remove the fish at the right size. So we don't want to take out small fish when we're actually catching big fish because that will misalign the number of fish removed. Um, so we're going to try and get this reasonably correct in the model. And so what I've got here is I've got, I've got an example of uh, three uh, fisheries. And if we combine them all together, we get the selectivity curve that's in the black, right? But you can see it's a kind of a weird double modal selectivity curve. And that's because two of the fisheries have quite different selectivity. So we have the gray one that's catching smaller fish and the orange one that's catching um, larger fish. Now, another issue with this is, is, is you might actually get changes in selectivity over time because the proportion of catch or effort between those two fisheries may change, and that would change, um, make this overall selectivity of the combined fisheries um, change over time. And so we don't want to do that really. We want to try and get uh, a selectivity pattern that's fairly smooth and fairly stable over time. And we can do this by defining uh, the fisheries. And what we want to do is we want to define fisheries so that the, the size or the age structure, the composition data, is uh, fairly consistent. Uh, within that fishery. Um, obviously, we would uh, separate the fisheries by gear type um, initially because generally different gears will catch different size fish. Um, but what we've done, um, and Clarity is the one that's mainly been doing this at the Tuna Commission, is used our tree date based methods to analyze the length composition data and then um, consider splitting up uh, those composition data by space, season, and perhaps year, country, sex, other categories as well. And so we've got an example here on the top right. Um, and you can see here that we tend to have um, a larger fish down here in the bottom and a more wider range of fish at the top. So when we apply our regression tree, it splits at five north to start with. So we get the split here. And as you can see, the, the larger ones on, in the southern part. Then as we go down the tree, we split again in the bottom part at 95. And so here you can see at 95, here we see a larger fish offshore and a wider range and smaller fish inshore. And in the northern part, we're splitting at 115. And so here you can see, again, we've got um, perhaps smaller fish inshore and a wider range and some larger fish offshore. Um, but as we split further, you can see here, there's a lot of splits here occurring. So we have to um, work out a way on, on how to uh, stop splitting. And this is really a, a variance bias uh, trade-off and also uh, a computational uh, trade-off as well, because the more fisheries you have, the more um, parameters you're going to estimate, the longer time it's going to take your model to run and, and maybe more convergence issues and things like that. So. Stopping and how many fisheries you include um, is something that you have to consider. There's also some other things that you might need to consider, like 
how to deal with growth and cohort strength, particularly if you have um, different years of data from the different areas or different time periods. Okay, so um, yeah, I'll stop it here again um, to see if there's any uh, questions on um, the developing uh, fishery structure. I have nothing in the queue yet, but we can wait 30 seconds to see if one pops up or if a raise hand comes up. Okay, I'll, I think I'll just go on to selectivity because fishery structure and selectivity are fairly connected. And so if someone wants to bring up something about fishery structure, we can do it in the selectivity. Sounds good. Uh, okay. So um, for selectivity, one of, one of the biggest things to think about here is the difference between selectivity used for the fisheries, that's for the, the, the catch, and also for the indices of abundance. Okay, and so for a fishery, the main goal here is to remove the fish at the correct age or the correct size. And so what the selectivity curve is really doing is smoothing over the sampling era in the composition data. And it's also um, helping us fill in for missing years, perhaps, or even missing years if we want to share selectivity among uh, fisheries, particularly if we don't have any composition data for a particular gear type. Um, we could allow the composition data to provide information on other quantities like uh, fishing mortality, natural mortality, recruitment growth, and stuff like that, but not necessarily a good idea because um, it can cause some, some biases, particularly with a lot of variability in, in the, the way the fisheries behave. Um, and so what we, we typically do for fisheries is we want to use areas as fisheries um, to model basically availability. and um, look at using flexible time varying selectivity curves. Now, um, in contrast to that, um, selectivity is used for the indices of abundance, including those ones based on catch per unit effort. Um, what we're doing there is we're using the selectivity to represent the ages, uh, to, to model the ages uh, that are represented by the index. So again, we're, we're also smoothing over the sampling error but in this case, we we don't no lead, we don't need to uh, fill in for for missing years because the survey is just not used for the missing years. We also typically want to allow the composition data to provide information on other quantities like fishing mortality, um, natural mortality, recruitment growth, um, and so. The, the selectivity for the index is generally representing the whole stock, so it's more like the contact selectivity. Um, or at least the whole stock that's represented by the, the index. And to provide information about other quantities in the model, we really want to have a time invariant uh, functional form. So a smooth type of selectivity that doesn't change over time. Otherwise, you'll, you'll lose a lot of the information from, from that index. So because of that, you want to make sure you design your surveys and your CPU, CPUE analysis to make the selectivity smooth, time invariant, and as methodic as possible. Um, one, one way of thinking about selectivity is it's, it's a way to, to deal with uh, variation in the composition data. And so if that variation is caused by sampling error, then we use a smooth selectivity, like a functional form, uh, to smooth over the sampling error. We don't want to model the, we don't want to uh, allow the selectivity to follow the, the, the sampling error. If there's uh, changes in contact selectivity, then we want to use time varying selectivity curves. Um, if there's spatial variation in the age or size of fish, um, that's where we start using the fishery definitions to model that, that variation in the composition data or a spatial model if that's necessary. Um, but in general for fisheries, we are basically using a combination of all of these three uh, approaches because the variability is being caused by all three. Another important uh, point in modeling selectivity is we need to know how, um, to know whether or not we're modeling the sampling error, right? or allowing the model to fit to error rather than to smooth over it using the selectivity curves. And so generally the way this is done is, is when we start estimating the smoothness, smoothness parameters like um, 
the number of knots and things like that in a in a spline or or the um, the the penalty or the standard deviation of random effects when we're allowing parameters of functional forms to change over time. Um, another important component of, of selectivity is deciding whether it's age or length based or even both. Um, and generally, what we want to do is probably use length specific selectivity for contact selectivity and age specific selectivity for availability. Um, one thing that's been um, shown quite often is that um, spatial variation in, in the distribution of the fish or the fleet can cause uh, issues in selectivity. And you know, Dave Sampson's been doing a lot of this and, and uh, particularly some work with Lynn Waterhouse um, on, on how that um, spatial variability um, can make the selectivity dome-shaped and uh, change over time. And so you can see here on the right-hand side, even though the contact selectivity here, which is in the uh, dotted line, is asymptotic, the selectivity of all fisheries combined uh, relative to the population abundance is actually dome-shaped. And it's even more apparent when you look at areas fleets. So in each area, you might actually get quite dome-shaped selectivities when you're comparing the length comps caught in that area compared to the total population. Um, and this can easily be shown um, based on some uh, sort of conceptualization of the spatial distribution of fish. And so you can see here that if you're only fishing in this area, you're mainly catching fish, uh, large fish, and therefore the selectivity is, is more asymptotic. Whereas if you're only fishing in this area, you're actually catching a lot of small fish and only a few large fish compared to the distribution in the whole population. And so therefore this selectivity would be uh, dome-shaped. And so if you end up getting changes in the um, allocation of effort between these over time, you're going to go back and forth from asymptotic to dome shape. So you're going to get time variation in, in the selectivity. And um, the effect of the assumptions about selectivity can be very influential on, on management quantities. And here's just a simple example with a dome shape case and a logistic case. And you can see here, differences in the estimates of uh, MSY and the depletion level. Um, in this case, it didn't change the fishing mortality rate ones that much. But again, different applications get different results, but we see this very commonly that uh, results from dome and logistic selectivities are, are quite different. Um, so one thing that we've also been looking at is, is using splines uh, for modeling selectivity, and these are very flexible. Um, so you can see here, you've got this, this is uh, selectivity, the, the blue is the selectivity used in the model and the dots is the empirical selectivity. And so you can see quite a very strange shape with a very long tail. Um, and Ricardo, who has worked for us for a few years, developed some R code to calculate the empirical selectivities and also uh, a way of uh, automatically calculating the uh, number and the location of the knots for, uh, for uh, splines. So um, one thing that we found in our tuna applications um, is that we often quite get some quite weird looking selectivity curves with double normals and long tails and things like that. And so we don't really want those. We want things that are well, uh, more well behaved. And so if you get uh, selectivity curves that look like this, that are kind of double normal, um, it's probably because you need to redefine your fisheries, either by area, but often it could be by season, which is something that people don't think about often. Um, but there are, might be other things like gear effects and gear and things like that. Um, and what happens here is if you do get these double modes, often it's uh, each of the modes is a different, uh, should be a different fishery. And as you get different effort allocation among, among those modes, you get the temporal change in selectivity as well. So selectivity changes over time. Um, we also get these long tailed ones, um, which is not what you'd expect because you'd expect the population to be uh, declining um, like that over time. 
uh, sorry, over age or, or size. And so um, this is something that, that again, you, you're not expecting. You probably should deal with, um, particularly for changes over time and, and restructure of your fisheries. And the final one is when you get really, you get jagged predictions, but the observ observations are smooth. And often this might occur because in the model, you're assuming recruitment's occurring at one time per, per year, whereas in the actual data, you're getting uh, continuous recruitment, so it's more smooth. Um, or it could be because you've assumed, assumed a variation of length of age that's too narrow. Um, and so it's, you're getting those peaks in your predictions. Okay, so um, like I mentioned before, um, it's probably a good idea to try and model the time varying selectivity. Um, and if you have known changes, you know, it's pretty easy to put time blocks in the selectivity. Um, but most of the changes are not known in advance. And so there's, there's multiple ways of doing that. Um, and so it's common to use uh, random effects where you would have the are the parameters of functional forms to be random effects. Um, but you could also have um, like uh, Anders and his uh, colleagues use in their models where you have age time random effects, um, perhaps random walks over time. Um, and when they do that, they um, combine multiple fisheries together um, because they're just trying to model the, the, the catch coming out of the, the population at the right size. And um, by combining the fisheries, you can have a lot fewer parameters, um, but also you may not be modeling sharp changes in effort color uh, allocation among gears as well. You could try and do the same thing with uh, length specific selectivity, because, but because you've got a lot more lengths than ages, you might often have too many parameters uh, to model. Um, with, with these random effect um, type, uh, modeling random effects for uh, temporal variation and selectivity, um, you have to estimate the uh, the variance of those random effects or the smoothing parameters. And so this can be often a uh, computationally demanding um, approach as well. And so that's one issue that needs to be uh, considered when developing methods for doing selectivity. Other approaches are the time varying um, non-parametric approaches like time varying splines. Um, but in this case, you need nodes in both uh, in two dimensions. Um, and again, you have to estimate the uh, nodes on the smoothness parameters. Um, and another thing with time varying selectivity, you have to be careful again that you're not just fitting to noise, um, but you're trying to remove the fish at the, the right size and age by, by smoothing across that uh, sampling noise. Okay. So after that sort of fairly waffly uh, description of uh, selectivity. Um, I came up with this uh, flow chart this morning. Um, so like everything else in this presentation, it's all uh, um, in progress and, and is likely to change over time. But um, simply here, the, the first question to ask is, are you going to use this information for estimating things like fishing mortality? And if you are, then you want to separate the fisheries by gear and area, and then use asymptotic time invariant functional forms for your selectivity. So um, not so uh, keen on doing this, so not necessarily recommended for fishery selectivity. Um, so if we're not gonna use it for that type of information, um, are there any large differences in selectivity? If there are, then you wanna separate the fisheries by gear and area, so perhaps, separating out the, the fisheries that catch small fish and the fisheries that catch uh, large fish. Um, and then once you've done that, you go back to the same path here. And so then the next question is whether or not the uh, selectivity is uh, length-based or not, or where you'd need to, to model it by length-based, even if it, if it is length-based, maybe age-based will work. Um, if you don't need to, then perhaps just using the random walk in, in, in age, like Anders and his group do, is, is the way to go. However, if you need length-based selectivity, maybe you need to have uh, time-varying splines. So that's an idea of, of how to uh, think about what you should be doing in, in modeling uh, fishery selectivity. So um, 
I'll open it up for, for, for questions on selectivity and maybe on uh, fishery structure as well. But again, for fisheries, we want to remove the fish at the right size, you use dome shape, uh, flexible uh, time varying selectivities and uh, redefine fisheries to uh, remove weird selectivities. And then for indices, you want to make sure you standardize the CPUE and the um, associated length comps using spatial temporal models and then try and use the asymptotic time invariant functional forms if that's possible. So do we have any questions on selectivity or fishery structure? We do have some questions on selectivity and I'll go in the order I got them for this category. Um, from Michael Sherpa, shouldn't we expect residual residuals in the selectivity if a strong weak year class moves through such that not all residuals are bad? Well, we, we don't want residuals in terms of misfitting the link frequency data, we want to fit those well. But yes, as a as a strong cohort comes through, you might find that the selectivity changes because of of targeting um, the strong cohort. And we've seen that in, in quite a few populations where where fishes will actually move to a particular size of fish because they're of strong cohorts, so they're easier to find and and uh, uh, more profitable to to fish on. Yeah, um, these two questions are related. One's from um, Devorah Hart. Dome selectivity due to spatial effects are often temporary, which can cause problems if you're using them to estimate reference points. And then Jimmy and Ellie came through with a, when would fishery selectivity never be used for info on F? So kind of two similar thoughts here. Yeah, so um, yeah, I agree. So so we're, we're, um, we see time varying selectivity uh, quite frequently. And um, that makes it very difficult to determine um, the management reference points because the what you're using for selectivity for calculating MSY changes over time. So you need not only dynamic reference points in terms of the average recruitment, but also in terms of the um, selectivity of the fisheries. Um, but also, when you think about that, management should not necessarily be setting up its reference points in terms of the current selectivity. They should be setting it up in terms of what they think the selectivity might want to be um, rather than, because obviously if you're fishing only catching small fish, that's not very um, efficient in terms of total yield and may not even be that efficient in terms of uh, profits. So. Um, mainly what I'm talking about here is, is stock assessment and um, the management components of this brings on another um, level of complexity. And um, in terms of Jim's question about when should you be using fishery composition data for um, providing information on things like fishing mortality and other parameters. So um, yeah, in general, it's probably not a good idea However, if you're able to analyze your fishery information in, in a reasonable way and, and you try to overcome some of the issues, um, for example, like turning CPUE into an index of abundance and associated composition data, it might actually turn out to be quite informative about some of the model parameters that you have that are uncertain, like natural mortality, fishing mortality, recruitment growth, um, and you may not have a survey, so that's the only thing you can do. So it's it's a trade-off between what other information you've got and how well you can um, standardize the CPUE and related composition data to make it actually informative. Okay, um, I think I better go on to the, the next topic, which is growth. So this is getting into the biological components of stock assessment. And growth is probably the, the process, both biological and maybe even fishing, that we have uh, the most good information on for a lot of species. And we typically know uh, how fast individuals are growing from those cohorts that are either caught most frequently or most abundant in, in the population. And so this is very 
useful for things like yield per recruit analysis or age structured production models where most of the action is actually in those most abundant ages. However, if we're fitting to length composition data, either for the, uh, from the fishery or from the surveys, um, then the growth, particularly if it's length composition data, um, then the growth of all fish, particularly the, the old ones, is important. And so I've just got a simple example on, on the right-hand side here, where we have, uh, this is the level of uh, asymptotic length. And so we've got low, the base value and a high value. And um, we've got two different management quantities here, um, a spawning biomass one and a fishing mortality one. And you can see here, it can go from uh, overexploited and overfishing um, to underexploited and underfishing just by changing that uh, value of uh, asymptotic length and not really by that much either. I'm not sure what this value here is, but I think it's like 10%. Um, the other thing to note here too, is that these different values here between these three sets of um, panels is the difference in the uh, standard deviation of the variation of length at age. And you can see even that has a substantial influence on the results, not as much as the asymptotic length, but still has a, an impact. So you really need to get the growth right if you're fitting to length composition data. And that's including the variation of length at age. Um, so how do we estimate growth? Um, well, you really need to estimate it inside the stock assessment model um, to deal with age or length-based sampling factors. And so the age-based sampling factors could be things like um, spatial um, sampling areas when you have ontogenetic movement, um, where the length-based ones can be uh, length-based selectivity, or more importantly, the um, length categories that are used to collect the data. Often, um, people will collect uh, a certain number of individuals from each length category to make sure you get a range of sizes of, of fish to include in the, the growth analysis. And so you can see here, um, we have um, some simulated data results here. And the, the first uh, violin plot is from basically an integrated model. It's an approximation to an integrated model. And then this is just a traditional approach by fitting to the data that we have. So this is fitting to age length data. And so for asymptotic length, the growth rate and the variation length at age, you can see that the if you don't integrate it into the model, you can get quite a lot of bias, particularly for the uh, standard deviation of uh, length at age. And so to deal with that, you really need to integrate the um, data into the stock assessment model. Um, another important component about um, modeling growth is that often we use uh, functional forms like the von bertel Um The problem with these is that the functional forms control the estimates of uh, length of age over the whole age range. And so um, points at young ages can actually have an influence on the, the length of age at old ages. And this is particularly uh, important because most of the time we um, get a lot more samples of young fish because th there's more of those in the population and, and they might be more selective as well. Um, and so you can see here as an example uh, fitting to some data. And if we fit the von bertel Amphi, because we have a lot of uh, small individuals, we actually can't fit the bending over of the growth curve very well. Um, so what often we might do is we might more use a more flexible growth curve like the Richards. And so here you can see we're fitting the data better, but perhaps not perfectly. Um, and then if we fit this other uh, growth model, which has the same number of parameters as the Richard, but has less of a link between the young and the old fish, we actually seem to fit the, the, the data a little bit better. Um, so, uh, the lesson here is basically we've got to make sure that we use a reasonably flexible growth curve to be able to fit the data. We don't want to get biases by um, having an inflexible growth curve that's been controlled by uh, fish of a certain age. And also when we're estimating growth, we want to use all the data that we can. Um, you know, we can have growth information by from uh, age length data from odorless, we can get it from tag growth increments, or we can get it from the length frequencies. 
Um, and so here's an example here where we have, um, we can only age the, I think it's big eye probably, up to about age four. Um, and so you have uh, length, uh, age length information from otoliths for the young fish, but we don't have any for the old fish. And so we get that from the uh, tagging data, so we can we can tag them and let them grow and catch them when they're old. So we get information about um, the size and growth rates of older fish. Um, the issue with doing this is we actually have to model the age uh, of the tagged individuals as a parameter to make sure that the information is consistent between the different data types. Um, and if we want to use uh, length frequency data, we probably really should be doing this uh, inside the stock assessment model. Um, so we can take into consideration things like uh, selectivity and, and uh, recruitment strength and things like that. Um, one issue with this tag growth increment approach is if we want to integrate that into the stock assessment, we're adding in a lot more parameters because we need a parameter for each uh, tagged individual. Um, because we have a lot of information on growth, um, often we can uh, know about a lot more detail about the processes that are going into growth. And so, for example, we see a lot of uh, temporal variability in, in growth. And we can deal this, with this in a few different ways. Um, we could use empirical uh, weighted age data. So we, we need a lot of catch at age information. Um, but we have to make sure here that we, we uh, take into consideration the sampling error and we also have to fill in for missing years and gears. And so this might require us uh, modeling the, um, the weighted age uh, outside the stock assessment somehow to, to fill in these gaps. Uh, alternatively, we could model the uh, temporal variability and growth inside the, the stock assessment model. Uh, we could use the functional forms like the growth rates, uh, the growth uh, equations like the Von B, Richards, et cetera. And in this case, we could uh, model the uh, parameters of those um, growth curves over time. Um, if we do that, we don't want to have a different growth curve, a different functional form for, uh, or parameters of the functional form for, for each year. We actually want to model the growth increment. Um, and that's something that's in uh, stock synthesis. So that just makes sure that we have, um, the right type of change in growth from one year to the next. We also have to uh, consider whether or not the growth uh, is occurring in a particular, every, uh, all individuals in a particular cohort are growing at a different rate, or perhaps all cohorts are affected by uh, an annual effect on growth. Uh, we could also have uh, non-parametric or semi-parametric approaches um, but all of these approaches, we're going to have to estimate uh, the smoothness penalties um, to make sure that we're, again, not modeling uh, sampling error. Uh, we're modeling the, the actual process error. Density dependence is also being shown to have a big influence on uh, growth, uh, whether we model that uh, directly or we just uh, have that as part of the time varying growth is something that needs to be considered. But all of these approaches, we need uh, a lot of age length data to be able to model this, this growth variability. Um, another aspect which is often uh, overlooked, um, but may be more important is spatial variability in, in growth. And, and one way of thinking about this is thinking about uh, spatial differences in the length composition data and how, how they uh, are coming about. So, First of all, you've got to make sure it's not just um, sampling that's causing these differences in the length composition. So you've got to make sure that the the length uh, compositions are uh, not being differences are not being caused by things like time differences and when the um, individuals are sampled. Um, so it might be temporal variability rather than spatial variability. Um, we also got to think about the differences in the length measurements and conversion factors, sometimes they, they change over time or change between um, areas and things like that and gear types and everything. Uh, so basically, once you've ruled out issues due to sampling, um, it could be due to age. So it might be onto genetic movement. Um, in that case, maybe you want to use a, a spatial model 
or um, you might be able to use age uh, uh, selectivity curve as a proxy for availability and, uh, and deal with movement. And uh, Weiwa did this for North Pacific uh, bluefin and she found it, it, it uh, performed fairly well. And so you can see here, um, she used a age specific um, selectivity in uh, two different areas. And um, so that age specific uh, selectivity was shared with all the fisheries that fished in the same area. And so they had a, had a common uh, availability um, set of parameters, but then each fishery had a different contact selectivity, which is based on uh, length-based selectivity. Seemed to have worked fairly well compared to some of the other methods, but not quite as good as, as knowing the exact processes that were going on. Um, it also could be caused by the age differences uh, the, the age effect could be caused by differences in exploitation rates, and in that case, you'd need to have a, a spatial structured model to model the local depletion. The differences could also be caused by actual differences in growth. Um, in this case, you'd probably have to have a spatially structured model. Um, but again, often you won't have a lot of information to estimate movement rates and things like that. So, um, and also, if you are getting spatial differences in growth, that means that uh, fish are growing differently in different areas. And so you have to know whether it's a genetic or environmental effect, and maybe it indicates there's not much movement anywhere. So until you have a lot of information on the stock structure movement and growth estimates, you might want to model the different areas uh, separately as separate uh, non-interacting populations. Um, the differences in the compositions could also be due to selectivity. Um, and you might expect this if they're different gears, but um, it's kind of questionable that you would have different uh, selectivity in different areas using the same gear. Um, so it's unlikely to be selectivity, I don't think. And of course, having a lot of age length data would help uh, differentiate the causes of, of these differences in length composition data. Okay. So again, another, a lot of waffling about uh, growth, but um, here is sort of like a brief summary of what we think, what I think might be the way to, to model growth. Um, first of all, you wanna estimate growth within the stock assessment model. You wanna use a, a, a reasonably flexible growth curve. So try and avoid using the von der Lanfe curve. Um, model time during growth, if there's adequate, uh, age length data or other types of information about growth. And um, I think the best way to start with to deal with spatial variation in, in growth is to model separate populations, uh, non-interacting populations, until you really have good information on the spatial structure and movement. So um, I'd like to open it up for questions on growth now, if we have any. We have a contribution from Trevor Branch. Seems like empirical weighted age is a much better idea than trying to estimate age length weight relationships within a stock assessment. Um, yeah, that, that might be the case if you have lots of information. Um, and even if you're going to do it, I think you want to do quite a bit of modeling outside the, outside the, uh, the stock assessment model to try and smooth over the sampling error. Um, so maybe some kind of like a space, you know, a similar type of model that you'd use for a sta spatial temporal model, but it would be over um, time and, and age or time and length. Yeah. Thanks for your patience. It's uh, triaging the, the comments. Andre is back. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. um, this is my best Pantanese translation. Uh, no interacting populations, let's talk, is what I think that says. And then you also mentioned, what about Ianelli-like smoothing, likely to what you were just talking about? Yeah, so so it's probably a good idea. I, I haven't seen a lot of that in the, in the literature, but I, I know there's a couple of recent papers that talk about it, which might be uh, useful. Um, and yeah, so... Spatial, spatial stock assessment is really complicated. Um, that's why I haven't talked about too much in, in this presentation. 
But the big thing is how do you deal with fish that change their growth as they move from one area to the next? That's kind of a, a really difficult problem uh, and may, may require age length models rather than just an age model or a length model, uh, length based model. So I think we'll, we'll carry on. Um, we've still got quite a few topics to cover. The next one is natural mortality. And I think this is pretty short, but basically, um, you know, we typically assume that natural mortality is constant over time, over age, over sex, uh, which is probably not correct. And there's a bit of information out there to suggest that's not the case. Um, and even back, what, 20, 30 years ago, or whatever, when I think it was VETA reviewed natural mortality, they suggested we should be dealing with that, and we haven't really dealt with it very well. Um, we probably expect the natural mortality to be higher for younger individuals, but perhaps independent of sex, um, since there's no behavioral changes due to sex uh, when they're younger in terms of spawning of that. Um, but when they get older, particularly perhaps when they mature, uh, maybe the natural mortality will increase uh, due to factors related to, to uh, reproduction, and it might be different between males and females. And so we, we've come up with this formula here that could be used to model uh, age and sex-based natural mortality based on um, different natural mortalities for uh, juveniles and adults, and also um, relating that to uh, the maturity of individuals. And some of these parameters could be, um, particularly the natural mortality parameters, could be based on proxies. And so here's an example of where we tried to estimate those on a sort of a, um, a earlier version of this equation for big eye tuna from tagging data. And so you can see here that we've got a decline in natural mortality for the juveniles and then an increase as they mature. But uh, the confidence intervals were very wide and, and so it wasn't a very good estimate. So, um, a lot of the proxies like using maximum age, uh, correlations with life history parameters and such uh, are, are quite imprecise. Um, there's been some work on estimating natural mortality inside the stock assessment model. And uh, it looks as though we can do it to some degree. Um, it's dependent on what kind of composition data is available. Um, and of course, the simulations were idealized in terms we, we, we had the assumptions correct. But even then, there was a, a bit of bias, um, you know, depending on the, the, the actual value of natural mortality. And, and again, here, these are different species. And so the performance differed between species, probably because of the, the data that was available in those assessments. Um, some of the information that's used to estimate natural mortality outside the model, like tagging data and, and uh, age composition data, can easily be integrated into the assessment to improve those estimates. So um, perhaps the, the way to go is to, to use the proxies as priors and then estimate the um, natural mortality inside the stock assessment model, um, making sure that the that the uncertainty used for those proxies to create the prize is, is, is the appropriate one and, and probably use the prediction error, which might be an overestimation of the uncertainty, but maybe that's a better way to do it when you're using a prior. But natural mortality is basically major issue number two that we have to deal with um, because uh, the lack of information we have about natural mortality and its importance in, in um, defining the stock assessment and management quantities. So for natural mortality, um, let's see if there's any questions on, on that. So far, we don't have any for natural mortality. Okay. Oh, wait, wait. Andre says multi-species models? Yeah, so um, multi-species models might help. Um, Typically, the largest amount of mortality caused by those interactions is due to juveniles, and, and it might be for fish that are smaller than those that are caught. So it 
it gets tied up within recruitment. So um, may not necessarily be something to deal with, but depending on the the um, what the model is being used for and whether the um, predation mortality is, is going to influence the results in terms of those objectives. Um, again, I, I I'm have ignored any multi-species uh, issues in this presentation because again, like spatial structure, it's a very complicated and, and large topic as well. Okay, so let's move on to the next topic, recruitment. I'm sure there'll be no questions here given my views on recruitment. Um, so basically the stocks recruitment relationship is unknown. That's kind of my premise on, on most of my work on stock recruitment. Um, simulation analyses have shown that it's, it's often difficult to estimate the um, steepness of the stock recruitment relationship. Um, typically with estimates going to one uh, for quite a few of the uh, simulation data sets. And so you can see here a couple of different um, studies, another one by Weiwa um, using several different species. And so you can see here the, the estimates at one, even though the true value was, was lower. Um, and this one here is for summer flounder, so similar type of results. Um, in my opinion, um, I don't think for at least for assessment purposes that the um, recruitment, the stock recruitment relationship is, is that important, except for specific situations where either you have low fecund species, like for example, sharks, and in that case, you want to focus on survival. So the number of pups can be used as part of the stock recruitment relationship. And um, Ian Taylor has a paper describing this functional form that's used in uh, stock, that's in, uh, in stock synthesis. The other one is when the population is extremely low sizes. But if your population is that low, there's other things that are going on that are way more important. For example, like the spatial extent of spawning, or there's going to be huge amounts of growth of fishing. So management should actually be um, trying to deal with some of those problems um, before the if the stock recruitment relationship is, is going to be influential in terms of the assessment. Um, so um, for recruitment, um, probably should for assessment purposes, assume that it's independent of stock size. Um, but there's a few other things that we, we need to think about. Uh, one is then do we know need to know the um, standard deviation of the variation in, in recruitment? Um, and if, if we know that approximately and use penalized likelihood, is that uh, an okay way to do your assessment? Or do you actually have to estimate the standard deviation and use random effects, which is more computationally intensive and, and not available in some of the um, assessment methods like uh, stock synthesis, although there are some approximations to, to deal with that. Uh, we also need to deal with the bias correction um, and developing average recruitment for management quantities when we use the penalized likely approach. But you know, Rick and Ian have got approaches to, to overcome that. Um, there are some times when you might have to uh, have some special uh, treatment of recruitment, particularly if you, if you want to predict it in the future. For example, if you're using catch quotas on shortlist species, and in that case, you might want to uh, include environmental covariates, autocorrelation, and, and there it might actually be important to estimate the standard deviation of the uh, annual recruitment leaves. As far as management goes, um, I think it might be a better to, to think of um, management and assessment uh, separately. And then, um, for management, the stock recruitment relationship be, can be quite important because uh, it's um, highly, uh, the MSY-based reference points are highly dependent on also uh, depletion levels. So if you have specific depletion reference points for limit reference points, like 20% of virgin and things like that. Um, but I think we sh you should be uh, thinking about trade-offs and things, um, and you should be doing this in a, a management strategy evaluation context so that the the goals of uh, management can be taken into consideration as well as the uncertainties. And one thing I just wanted to point out is that um, 
uh, one thing that Jen Fing did in his paper was looked at the trade-offs of, of over-specifying or under-specifying steepness of the Bevan Holt model. And in this case, it was actually, it's better to assume a lower value of steepness in terms of equilibrium yields or loss in equilibrium yields than actually to assume a higher level of steepness. So perhaps a precautionary approach on steepness might be valid, but you'd want to uh, test that in a full MSE type framework. Okay, so um, talk about recruitment. Um, I'm, I'm sure no one has any questions on this, um, but assume recruitment is independent of stock size, except in specific situations like low fecundity and, and very low population size. Um, use a random effects to model the variability in recruitment if it's feasible. Otherwise, fix the standard deviation at a, at a reasonable value. Use penalized likelihood. Do the bias uh, correction appropriately. And then when you're gonna do management quantities, don't use the parameters from the model. Basically, average the recruitment over the desired areas that you want to do your management, that you want to base your management quantities on. And then deal with any management um, uh, decisions through a full management strategy evaluation process so that you can take uh, uncertainty about the stock recruitment relationship into uh, consideration when developing management uh, advice. So let's let's see if we any have, have any questions on recruitment. Yeah, um, Andre would probably like me to let you know that he called BS before even seeing the slides, which I'm <laughs> sure is not a surprise. Uh, his, he does actually have a constructive question of what about regime shifts in mean recruitment? And it sounds like he's thinking about big eye. Yeah, so. Um, for any time varying process, the um, you know randomly distributed uh, values of that process over time may not be that important, but regime shifts and trends in those processes are going to have uh, the biggest influence on the results, and those are the things that you want to to model. Um, when you have regime shifts, you have big changes in, in something and that doesn't necessarily get modeled that well with, with um, you know, like recruitment deviates, so randomly distributed deviates. Um, so there may, may be some issues there, but I'm, I'm, I have a feel that, that it's not as bad as, as perhaps um, other issues in the model. It really comes down to how it's used for management. And that's where you'll get the issues and therefore things like dynamic reference points might be important. But again, that might be best dealt with through the full MSE process rather than actual doing the assessment itself. Uh, any other questions? Jim Anelli wants to know, are shifting baselines good? And I don't know if that's a, a bit yeah. of a sarcastic comment okay. or, yeah. Yeah, so so shifting baselines, um, well, it depends on what you mean by shifting baselines, but um, the, having reference points that change over time. So because let's say recruitment changes over time, therefore your reference points should change over time. I think for target reference points, it makes sense, particularly for the average recruitment um, changing over time. For limit reference points, it may not because Limit reference points are there to stop um, having effects on recruitment due to the stock size. And so it may be more about the absolute level of the spawning abundance that's important, not its, um, it's how relative it is to MSY. So I think in some, in, for some management quantities, uh, shifting baselines are fine for like, like targets, but perhaps for limits it may not be. Okay, I think we probably should move on. Um, so the next topic is data weighting. This is something that I kind of find a lot more interesting than some of the biological um, components of stock assessment, but uh, that's because I'm a bit of a geek, I guess. Um, so basically we don't really want to fit to sampling noise. And that's part of the um, reason for 
um, talking about data weighting. And so we don't want to overweight the data to fit to the noise, or we don't want to over-parameterize the model and fit to the noise. Um, and the stock assessment model is really used to smooth over the sampling error. So to make sure that we're not fitting to the noise. Um, the other important um, factor I want to point out here is I don't think you should account for model misspecification and unmodeled process variation in the likelihood function. But that's what we do. We use the likelihood function to represent all the uncertainty, right? But I think we should be using the likelihood function just to represent the sampling error. There, there may be one sort of caveat to that is if it's important to estimate the total uncertainty in the model, you know, for example, if doing model averaging, uh, we may want to account for model misspecification and modeling, unmodeled process error in the likelihood, but um, we can sort of get to that later if people want to discuss that. Okay, so uh, Kevin and I came up with the, the law of conflicting data. And basically it's just that um, data are facts. The data is the data, unless someone has um, falsified the data, the data is what you've got. And that's the information you have about your, your uh, system. So if there's any conflict in the data, this implies that there's some kind of model misspecification. It might be misspecification in the processes, or it might be specification in the observation model, which ties the the uh, population dynamics model to the data themselves. Um, but there is a caveat to this. You have to make sure that you uh, interpret this conflict in the terms of random sampling error. So it may actually not be conflict. It may just be that there's, there's a lot of uh, sampling error in your data and so it looks like conflict. Now, the si significance of this law is that downweighting or dropping conflict in data, which is often done is not necessarily the appropriate thing to do because it's it's got rid of the conflict but or at least at least the um, perception of conflict but it hasn't it may not have solved the model specification right if, if the model specification was in the observation model for a particular data then yes dropping that data might have got rid of that but if the model specification was in the, the process uh, part of the model, then it's not going to get rid of that. Okay, so really we want to make sure we get rid of um, conflicts in data. Okay, so I think that the way to go about this is to basically uh, specify the sampling error and use that as uh, your likely in your likelihood function, and then we want to model all the process variation that that makes sense, and also fix all the models and the specification. And so because the uh, likelihood is representing the sampling error, we've got to estimate these sampling variances. And so for composition data, um, we might be able to do that using bootstrapping um, of the composition data. And, and I've seen a couple of examples of that. Um, we're coming up with a CV uh, for fitting an index of abundance. I think a good approach to do that might be to fit an age structured production model that has recruitment deviance. And basically that just means you're fixing the selectivities and, and other parameters um, that you might estimate using composition data at certain values. And then um, just estimating the scaling of the, the model, so the virgin recruitment and the recruitment deviance every year. And so that gives it quite a lot of flexibility for, to fit the index of abundance. Um, and it's basically a way of smoothing over the, the sampling error um, based on what you think the population dynamics would allow. Um, okay, so another thing um, that supports this is I did some simulation analysis of different um, composition uh, likelihood functions. And what I found there was um, because you're estimating the uh, effective sample size in, in these different uh, likelihood functions, um, you're adding a little bit more uh, variance into the calculations. And the, uh, in terms of the total error, estimating that variance was only 
better if you were actually out by about half an order of magnitude in your in your guess at the variance. And so again, this this is something that suggests that getting an external estimate of the uh, sampling error um, might be uh, the best way to to approach uh, doing the data weight here. Now, another thing that has been um, brought up, you know, recently, uh, particularly by Chris Francis, is uh, correlation and residuals, particularly in terms of uh, composition data. And you know, the way he suggested to deal with that was, um, or at least his initial suggestion was basically estimating the the sample size based on uh, fitting to the mean length or the mean age. Um, and that would, was some, somewhat dealing with the correlation and residuals, and taking that into consideration in the sample size. Um, but what I think we should be doing is, is, again, we should be somehow bootstrapping the composition data and um, coming up with estimates uh, of the correlations and using that in some kind of multivariate uh, likelihood function, probably uh, a log normal or something similar. Um, and so therefore you're automatically taking into consideration correlations due to the sampling process. And any other um, correlations are probably caused by the model misspecification. And because the goal of the analysis to get rid of that model misspecification, then uh, hopefully by the time we've fixed our model, we won't have that additional uh, correlations in, in the residuals. Okay, so as far as is my suggestions for, for data weighting is basically assign the effective sample sizes uh, and CVs for the likelihood functions based on the sampling error. Uh, so bootstrap for compositions, fitting the age structure production model or recruitment Ds for the index and include any correlations in the composition data through using a multivariate uh, distribution if, if that's needed. And then basically model the process variation and then try and fix all the model specification. So any other, any questions on, on data weighting? Yes, they're who you think they're from. Andre says correlations and residuals over time. Over um, time? Yeah. Uh, bet between composition um, categories, I guess, like ages and lengths. His second question is, what about non-representative samples for comps? Think Australia. Yeah, so um, unrepresentative samples means that your um, observation model is probably wrong because you haven't um, applied the appropriate selectivity curve to the appropriate component of the population. So. Um, you might have to reject that particular sample because you, it's not possible for you to model the observation model well enough to, to use that in the data without getting bias. Okay, any, any others? Um, Andre just also acknowledges that process error is hard to get right. Uh, yeah, and that's my next topic probably. Uh, no other questions at this time. Okay, so let's move on. Yes, I was right. It's process variation. Okay, so there's been a few studies. Um, I think um, Ian Stewart and, and um, Steve Martel did one on selectivity or, or growth or something like that for hell of it. But um, where they've shown that um, if you model process variation when it's not present, you get a little bit of reduction in precision, but not a lot. Um, however, if you don't model the process variation when it's present, you can get possible uh, large biases. So it, it, this suggests that you should model process variation um, even if it's not there. Um, but it's particularly important to model process variation when there's, there's trends and regime shifts um, in the process. Uh, if it's just simple random variation, um, it may not be that important. It may depend on which which process we're, we're talking about and what data the process is related to. Um, there are quite a lot of issues uh, in modeling uh, process variation. Um, you know, there's, I've seen a lot of examples where people have modeled 
uh, process variation, particularly in things like natural mortality, where there's very little information in the data about it, and it's not clear whether or not that that's a good thing to do. Um, and maybe you need to know what the standard deviation of that process variation is um, to be able to do that. Maybe you can't estimate it in front of the model. Um, another thing is that if you if you start modeling process variation, um, you have a lot of flexibility in your model, um, and it may actually be just adjusting for other models for misspecification, and so uh, that might cause some problems. Um, you you know if you have process variation, you, you have to know how large that variation is. And so do you estimate the standard deviation? Do you fix it? If you fix it, where do you get the information from to fix it? Um, the, you know, there's um, state space is kind of the, the sort of the, the um, trendy term to use for, for modeling process variation. Um, I've always thought about it in terms of random effects. Um, and they're basically the equivalent um, way of doing something, just a diff different way of thinking about it and also a different way of programming it. Um, and if, if you actually, like in TMB or maybe even ADMB, um, if, you, if you model um, the process variation as random effects, it's actually not very computationally uh, efficient. Whereas if you do it in the state space approach, um, it is. So you probably should be modeling it as a state-based um, sort of way of, of coding it. However, it makes it a lot harder to program and conceptualize. Um, so that's one thing to think about. Um, another thing is whether it's just a random process variation or whether you have to model the autocorrelation. And is that actually going to help in terms of fitting the model and, and that or, or is it important if you're just doing predictions um, so an important thing um, that i think we still need to, to to deal with is it practical to estimate um, this process variation and that's in terms of things like computational time memory requirements convergence issues if you're modeling multiple um, process errors and things like that so it's something that's that's important to deal with. Okay, so what process variation should we model? Obviously, we should be modeling recruitment, and I think that's probably important whether or not you have a, uh, a lot of information on recruitment or not. Um, selectivity, again, yes, I think we should be modeling, for, particularly in integrated models with composition data. For fisheries, you should be modeling time variation and selectivity. Natural mortality, uh, I'm still not sure on that one, possibly, but I don't really know. Um, and growth, probably if you have lots of uh, age length data. Um, and again, like someone brought it up as a question here, whether you model it inside the model or whether you use uh, empirical weighted age data is, is something that needs to be considered as well. Okay, so does anyone have any questions on modeling process variation. Yeah. Um, let's take one from Jim Ianelli here. Uh, sure. If one can't hear so well, I can't, I being Jim, state-based models can sound like faith-based models. Point being that evaluation of processes tend to get lost. For example, mortality rate variation from means get lost in interpretation. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of have the same feeling. I mean, I, I feel that state space models are kind of like a trendy thing. Um, and, you know, the state space terminology is, is, is used, you know, when you're, you're doing a model to make you, your model sound like it's better than it really is. Um, we've used state-space models, you know, all the way back to um, Fournier and Archibald's first integrated models. Basically, had you know uh, variation and recruitment and stuff. It depends on how you model it, whether you integrate over the um, the state-space or not. You know, we use penalized likelihood. Um, 
you know, before before AD Model Builder and TMB came in, you know, there was some integration approaches. You know, Pat Sullivan did some really early stuff. I did some with Doriso before we, we could do it in AD Model Builder correctly. But we've been doing this for a long time. The question is, you know, what processes can you model the variability in and and you know whether whether you put a lot of different processes in, do you cause some problems and and do we have the computational um, power to actually estimate them all? And does it cause any biases if it's trying to explain model misspecification and things like that? So I think there's still quite a bit of work to do um, when we start thinking about modeling process variability, particularly for processes that we have very little information about in the data. Okay, so let's keep moving on. Yeah. Got a few more topics to, to cover, I think. Um, so diagnostics. So, so this is an important process of, of developing uh, your models. Um, it also helps to identify things like uh, the model and the specification. So there's, there's quite a few diagnostics that have been developed recently, and, and some of them are, are starting to, to show some promise. Um, unfortunately, we haven't automated them, and we haven't really got good criteria on, on, on how to interpret the results and things like that. Um, but just a few um, ones here. So this is the age structured production model uh, diagnostics. We've got the profile component profile likelihoods on uh, particularly R0, uh, which is used quite a lot to look at conflict between data, particularly about the scaling of the model. Uh, the one I like is uh, empirical selectivity. Um, it's actually basically just looking, it's, it's like looking at, um, fits the link frequency comp, but because it's based on selectivity, it's, it's in a better scale, so you can easy to see the, the issues. Um, uh, Laurie Cowell's got some hindcast cross-validation stuff that seems to be promising as well. So there's quite a few, but we, um, we really need to, to, to investigate this more thoroughly. Um, Felipe's been doing quite a lot of work with several people to try and put all these together and, and help understand them, um, which is, it's been working out well. Um, but what we really need is we need some kind of algorithm that um, basically takes your model development through the diagnostics. And so you want to do something like start with a really good model, you know, based on, say, the good practices. And then we want to put it through this diagnostic algorithm. So we need some critical values for passing the diagnostics. And then from those diagnostics, if they fail, we need to identify what caused the failure and then recommend solutions. A um, few questions that we, we need to know is, you know, basically do retained models have to pass every diagnostic? Um, typically all our models have some bad diagnostics, so, so this is a hard hurdle to, to cover. Um, we did some risk analysis recently where we actually used the diagnostics to, to weight the models that we put in our assemble, ensemble for the um, risk analysis, but I personally not that comfortable with doing that because really our model should be passing the, the important diagnostics, otherwise that that actually may not be very good models. Um, so I think this is the kind of thing that we want to try and get going, and we and this is sort of thinking about the expert system for constructing um, basically an ensemble of models. And so you want to have uh, basically a good practices guide to give you some default assumptions to, to start your modeling. Um, you may actually have multiple models you put on there, depending on what the good practices guide suggests, you know, because there's some uncertainty in, in, in your understanding of that stock and the processes. That goes into the integrated analysis like stock synthesis. You get some results, it goes into the diagnostics and runs all the diagnostics. If it passes, then you can add that to the ensemble of models you're going to use for your management. If it fails, then the diagnostics would suggest uh, alternative assumptions that could resolve those issues. And so you might have multiple ways of resolving the issues. And it goes back into the integrated analysis, uh, analysis is done, and that goes through diagnostics again. And so the ones from that that pass go into your ensemble and those that fail maybe you want to uh, reevaluate them and see if you can fix those and, and uh, repeat the process and so we want to we want to be able to automate this 
but part of the way to automate that is to come up with some uh, rules for this diagnostics. So we need to do a lot of work here on diagnostics to see in what cases um, of model misspecification or unmodeled process error are causing what particular characteristics in the diagnostics. So we can come up with these um, recommendations on how to change the model to solve those model misspecifications. So does anyone have any questions or comments on uh, diagnostics? None sitting in the queue. Okay, well, let's continue. Okay, so I think this is the final one maybe um, before we get to the solutions of the major problems. So data limited methods. Um, I personally am not a fan of data limited methods. I think that they all should be integrated, uh, should be all implemented into a integrated model. Um, that shows my bias towards integrated models, but I have some reasonable um, reasons for, for, for saying that. And basically when you create an integrated model, you make all the assumptions explicit. So you explicitly say what the selectivity is, what the natural mortality is, what, what the um, assumptions behind the stock recruitment relationship are and things like that. Some of the data limited methods, you don't really know what those assumptions are. It also better represents uncertainty because you can add uh, un uh, you know, uncertainty in certain parameters, maybe putting priors on them and things like that based on the best available information. It's also when you have an integrated model, you're not just limited to a particular type of data or particular assumption. You can modify that model, you can add additional data so you can actually look at different sensitivities and, and things like that. So it's a lot more flexible in terms of how to, to look at the data. So, so my recommendation is to use an integrated model set up like the data limited method that you're, you're trying to, to implement um, and use that instead unless you've conducted MSC analysis that shows that the data limited method actually works better than the same approach used in integrated model. And uh, I'm going to skip over that because I think this is less important in terms of the type of stock assessment I'm talking about, but something that I'm sure people would be interested in discussing. Okay, so now we've We've got the third major issue, which is really not part of what we've been talking about before, but it's estimating absolute abundance. So one of the main goals or tasks of stock assessment is estimate the absolute abundance of the population. And we get this information from a couple of different places, but mainly from the index of abundance and basically how the catch causes a reduction in the uh, index of abundance. And so that can be used to determine the absolute abundance. Um, one thing we've got to do is we've got to make sure that we adjust that depletion caused by the catch by the productivity of the stock, which is the recruitment growth and natural mortality. So obviously we need to know this type of information to um, extract absolute abundance information out of an index of abundance. The other piece of data that we typically have, we estimate absolute abundance from, is the composition data. And so as uh, the pop, the, as the cohort ages, the uh, fishing and natural mortality reduce the abundance of individuals in that uh, cohort. And based on that, we can determine what the uh, fishing mortality is. And if we know what the fishing mortality is and the catch, then we can derive the absolute abundance from that. Now, we have to adjust that uh, decline in the uh, cohort over time for the natural mortality because it's also causing a uh, uh, reduction in the abundance of the cohort. Um, because we're observing the uh, composition data, the selectivity is having an impact on that observation, but it's also having an impact on the fishing mortality that's applied at different ages um, as well. So we have to know selectivity. Um, there's also sampling error and recruitment variability in the composition data that we see. So we've got to take that into consideration. And if we're using length composition data, we actually have to turn those lengths into ages to be able to do this catch curve type of analysis. So we need growth, recruitment, uh, sampling error, selectivity, natural mortality. So a lot of 
things that could uh, influence our uh, results depending on our assumptions. So um, there's a lot of uncertainty in, in estimates of absolute abundance from uh, the index of abundance or from the composition data. And one thing that I, I had forgot to, to address in the presentation um, and in something that I've sort of discussed a lot is actually the initial conditions and whether or not you're modeling the population from virgin using a total catch history or whether you're trying to estimate the um, numbers that age in at a certain time after exploitation had occurred. Right. Um, one thing to, to, to remember is that if you're using a total catch history model, this is when understanding the stock recruitment relationship might be quite important um, because you, you're basically getting a reduction in recruitment over a period where you don't have um, possibly don't have information on recruitment strength. Yeah. Uh, there also might be uh, error in some of the historical catch and also there might be regime shifts in recruitment that you don't know about because there's no information. Um, so estimating in initial conditions is actually a very important topic that, that I haven't covered um, and is particularly important to estimate the absolute abundance. But in general, the um, estimates of absolute abundance are probably uncertain, particularly uh, if you take all the uncertainty in the model processes into consideration when you're evaluating it. So the three major issues that I said I was going to address at the end of the talk is stock structure, natural mortality, and absolute biomass. Um, there's also the trying to come up with computationally efficient methods to estimate process variation, but that's kind of a, a different issue. So how do we deal with these? And basically the solution is, is close kin mark recapture. Close kin mark recapture is a fairly new methodology that Mark Brevington, um, Hans Gag and, and their colleagues have, have been developing over the last uh, probably 10 years or so. And um, because it can estimate these three quantities, I, th I think it's really going to be the future of, of, of stock assessment. Um, and um, we still need to estimate juvenile abundance, juvenile natural mortality in the stock recruitment relationship. So we still may need additional information and, and use integrated analysis and that to, to implement these, but at least it's filling in some of the major uncertainties in our stock assessments. Now, um, the reason why this is, is, is really good because it has a lot of benefits over traditional uh, mark recapture tagging studies. First of all, it can use dead fish. So you've got a lot more opportunities to do sampling. So you don't have to, be a, you don't have, to have a fishing method that um, can keep the fish alive. And, and so when you release them, they'll survive fairly well, right? Which is a lot of um, problems when um, trying to tag fish, particularly for us in tunas with the Persane fishery. Um, there's no tag-induced mortality, there's no tag loss and no misreporting. All three important factors um, in traditional tagging programs that have caused bias. But again, probably the most important is actually the dispersal of tags. And because it's based on parent offspring or, 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 or uh, half-sibling pairs, the, um, the tags basically get distributed through larval and juvenile dispersal. And so this provides a lot more mixing, particularly for highly fecund pelagic spawners like the tunas. And I think this, this is going to solve a lot of our problems. The costs of the programs are not much different from traditional uh, tagging programs. And um, so I think this is going to solve a lot of our problems. So that's, that's pretty much the end of my talk. Uh, here's a bit of a summary about some of the um, recommendations for the different processes. Um, I've also got some research questions here, um, but people can look at that later on. Um, but I think now it's a good time perhaps to open up to any questions on any of the topics. Sure, let's start with one from Steve Cadron. Um, if stock structure is major issue number one, why does it receive less attention in stock assessments than other decisions? Okay, well, partly because it's it's very difficult and we don't have a lot of information about it. Um, obviously, you know, you need a lot of genetic information or a lot of tagging information. Uh, typically, the the information that we do have 
um, like from tagging and genetics is, is not really enough. And, and you also have to not just know the stock structure, but you also have to know the exchange rates between the populations if, if it's not, you know, if, if, the, if the movement rates are, are enough to impact the assessments and you have to model them. Um, I also think it's probably less interesting for stock assessment people. I mean, most stock assessment people are into the fitting the population dynamics model and the mathematics and stuff due to that, as opposed to doing the data explorations required to look at um, stock structure. But with with the new genetic uh, analysis, like the closed kin, if you know if you find more related individuals in a certain area compared to with uh, the neighboring area, then you get an idea of, of how much exchange you have between those two areas. So um, again, I haven't done any work on close kin, so um, you want to talk to to Hans and, and, and Mark and their colleagues about that. But um, I think there's going to be a lot better information on structure, stock structure and exchange rates coming out of these types of genetic analyses that are being used now. Let's see. Um, if you don't mind jumping uh, categories, there's a question from Ian Taylor that I'm curious about too. Um, this was about back when you were talking about recruitment. What are your thoughts on the use of meta-analysis of things like steepness for West Coast rockfish? Um, of course, this is this is a place where we assume a stock recruit relationship. Yeah. So I, I'm not a fan of meta-analysis in any form. And the reason for that is because often the people who do the meta-analysis don't know the individual studies that they're putting together very well. And so they might be misinterpreting or using studies that aren't very good. Um, for recruitment in particular, most of the work that I've done that looking at the stock recruitment relationship, the estimates are coming from regime shift and recruitment that are unrelated to the stock recruitment relationship. And so it's very difficult to know in a meta-analysis whether the estimates of steepness that you're using in your meta-analysis are actually real um, steepness values or if they're just caused by regime shifts due to the environment. And so, yeah, I'm not, not fond of that myself. Thank you for that. Another question. Um from David Dye, who has left, but we'll catch this in the re recording. Um, this is about, I think, I think it was data weighting. Uh, how do you re reconcile how you collect the data to uh, to inform growth, tagging age length with fleet structure? Growth data is often collected independently of a survey, fish or uh, fishery, mm -hmm. independently of a fishery. Sorry, this is probably growth. Yeah. So if if it's, I think he's saying it's. It's either it's collected from a survey, um, then of course you want to put the have the survey selectivity um, uh, accounted for in that. But um, typically it's it's because of the uh, taking individuals from a certain length class that's causing a lot of the problems. So you might get ten small ones, ten medium ones, and ten big ones. And you need to take that into consideration. And that's where you use the age condition on length um, approach to, to modeling that composition data. And by doing that, you have to pretty much know the underlying population. So uh, abundance at age to do the calculation. And so the only way to do that is through the stock assessment model. Thank you. I think... I think I have one more from the queue and apologies to anyone that remains. Uh, please repeat the question if I missed it. But this one's all the way back from the beginning from Joel Rice. How do you deal with conflicting CPUEs uh, for or like increasing and decreasing from disparate fleets, say for a highly migratory species fished by many nations in a RIFMO setting? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so the first thing to do is to make sure that the, the CPUE is um, representative of the whole stock or the whole component. So for example, if it's adults, make sure that it re represents the abundance of all adults in the population. 
if it's only representing a, a, a sort of a certain area where, where the data comes from, then uh, any kind of spatial structure is going to cause problems. And so by using, if you have, you know, obviously if you don't have data from all areas, it's a problem, but if you have data from, from all areas, um, they're doing the spatial weighting and, and calculating the index of abundance from that is hopefully going to overcome some of those uh, spatial structure issues. Um, so it's 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 really down to to looking at um, the observation model that goes from your population dynamics to the observations. And so if you're only looking at uh, a small portion of the spatial component of the population, then you have to somehow either ignore that information because it's not very representative of the whole population. Use a spatial model so that you can account for that spatial structure or somehow combine um, multiple gear types together. So for example, if you have long line fisheries of five different nations and they have generally different spatial distributions, but perhaps some overlap, then maybe you can develop a spatial model that combines all of those um, different nations data together, but perhaps somehow modeling the selectivity and the catchability that differs between those nations. However, if you have some areas of overlap, then maybe that provides the information on those differences. And so um, it's probably a complicated analysis, particularly if you're using like a vast approach um, with, with where you'd probably have to include the uh, composition data in there. Um, but hopefully as as the methods get more efficient at implementing those models and probably computers getting faster and things like that, that it maybe it's something that's practical. Thank you. I did find another uh, CPUA related question. Um, full disclosure, sometimes when I'm <laughs> triaging the questions, I don't hear your full answer. So I will not be offended if you're like Kristen. I answered that already. <laughs> Um, okay. This one's from Ian Taylor. What are your thoughts about closed areas with no index or CPUE data or lower density areas with no fishing so you don't have CPUE data? Yeah, this, this is a problem. Um, obviously, it's, it's hard to, to fill in areas that are missing not at random. So if, they're missing, if missing at random, then it's just straightforward. Uh, when they're missing not at random is a problem because the reason they're missing is related to maybe their catch rates. And so for a closed area, um, obviously there's, one would hope there's, there's higher abundance in those areas because there's no fishing. Um, but it depends on the, on the movement rates and exchange rates of individuals and things like that. The thing that worries me more is when you have expansion and contraction of fisheries and, and part of the reason that they're not fishing in the area is because the catch rates are lower there. And so by filling in, you're filling in from information where there's higher catch rates into areas where there's lower catch rates just because there's no, there's no data in those low catch rate areas. So it's, a, it's an area that needs to be uh, further studied and perhaps things like environmental data um, barometric data, things like that, bath bathymetric data, things like that, where it's the information is um, sort of not in, uh, impacted so much by the decisions of the fishermen to to fish in a particular area, and so that might help. But again, it needs a, a, a some more work to, to to improve these methods, particularly using CPUE data. Thank you. I'm jumping down to uh, questions that came in while I was looking for other questions. Yeah. This one's from Matt Siski. You mentioned tagging and genetics information, but given the wealth of otolith samples typically already available due to aging needs, do you see any utility in otolith chemistry for stock ID within this framework, especially for Pacific highly migratories like tunas? Yeah, I, I think I think the genetic stuff is probably going to be a lot better. Um, partly because there's less uncertainty about the um, the information. 
I'm not a biologist and I don't know much about odorless microchemistry or even genetics and stuff like that, but uh, my understanding is there might be a little bit more fuzziness in the odorless uh, microchemistry um, as opposed to genetic le links of relationships between uh, parents and offspring, which I think a lot, a lot better determined. But obviously we should use as much information as we have until we get the close kin type of analysis under production for many species at low costs and things like that. Thank you. Um, Matt, Matt follows up with genetics, otochem answering questions on different time scales. Yep, he could be right, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Well, we've come down to the last five minutes or so of our two-hour mm -hmm. workshop. So um, I think you have given quite a lot of, you know, your time and energy today. So I think I'd like to give you the opportunity to have a rest now and thank the audience for um, being so responsive and attentive today. Um, next time, you can look forward to a think tank by Jimmy and Ellie. Finally, we can ask him the questions instead of Jim coming to us with his questions. Um, and uh, Mark, I'll send you a spreadsheet of all the comments and uh, questions from folks. And there's some cool discourse in the chat about um, this close kin stuff uh, among folks from across um, jurisdictions and organizations. So that was really cool to see that fostered here by your talk. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, thanks a lot. Appreciate everyone attending and asking questions. For sure. And we look forward to, uh, I'm sure you're looking forward to those calls for papers for that eventual CAPM. You've probably planted a lot of seedlings today. <laughs> yep. Well, that's the goal. <laughs> All right. With that, I'll let you go. And thank you, everyone. Look forward to seeing you next time. All right. Oh, I don't know if people are still keeping up with the, I'll keep trying to send the uh, closed kin conversations into the chat. Okay, Mark, I'm going to download this once it's done processing and send it to you. All right. Go ahead and stop recording.